tonight. Strengthening bonds. Putin visits North Korea and leads the way to agreements, enhancing the relationship between the two nations and signaling strengthened diplomatic ties on various fronts. Economic renewal. Li Chang extends his visits with China and Malaysia extending their economic partnership, considering enhancements for visa-free travel arrangements. Citizenship plan. President Biden promises a pathway to citizenship for spouses of US citizens aiming to streamline immigration processes and promote family unity. And it's never too late. A 105-year-old achieves a milestone by receiving her master's degree from Stanford University, completing a journey that began 83 years ago. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Some interesting stories are coming up tonight on our bulletin and we start off following the Chinese Premier's continuing visits. After concluding his visit in Australia, Chinese Premier Li Chiang, who arrived in Kuala Lumpur yesterday evening, met with the Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim in the administrative capital today. Li is on the third leg in a trip where he also visited New Zealand as China looks to expand its influence and investments in the Asia-Pacific amid geopolitical tensions and competition with the United States. China renewed a five-year economic and trade cooperation pact with Malaysia today and pledged to extend visa-free travel arrangements between the two countries as Chinese Premier Li Chang kicked off a visit to mark the 50th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Li, who arrived in Kuala Lumpur yesterday evening, was met with a welcome ceremony today ahead of a meeting with Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Following the meeting, Li and Anwar witnessed the signing and exchange of several bilateral deals, including in exports of fresh durians from Malaysia to China. Li is also expected to meet Malaysia's King Sultan Ibrahim and attend a groundbreaking ceremony today at a construction site for the East Coast Rail Link, part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. The 665-kilometer, 50.27 billion ringgit railway will connect the east and west coasts of Peninsular Malaysia by the end of 2026. First proposed in 2017, the rail link is being constructed by the Malaysian Unit of China Communications Construction Co. Limited. In March, Malaysia said it would consider extending the china back project to its border with Thailand. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in North Korea early this morning after saying the two countries want to cooperate closely to overcome US-led sanctions in the face of intensifying confrontations with Washington. Putin was met at Pyongyang's airport by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and they shook hands and embraced and the Kim later joined Putin in his car to personally guide him. we to get more updates on this, let's connect other than the world news special correspondent Minoli Sagaria joining us from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the update? Yes, we know. Thousands of North Koreans lined Pyongyang's wide boulevards today enthusiastically chanting Welcome Putin and waving Russian and North Korean flags as well as bouquets of flowers. Putin received a warm reception during a welcoming ceremony at King Tu Sang Square located in the heart of Pyongyang. The event featured mounted soldiers, military personnel and children holding balloons all cheering against a backdrop of large portraits of the two leaders. Putin and his counterpart Kim Jong-un presented their delegations and stood together as the Russian national anthem played. Russian media sources reported that Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un began talks. The summit is reportedly accompanied by officials 6 from North Korea and 13 from Russia. The summit was expected to last for about 90 minutes. What to look forward is to the summit's outcome as they have been discussing the signing of a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement for months now. Back to you, Vinut. Thank you. And that was Adil Nabil News Special Correspondent Minoli Sagaria joining us from Kursk in Russia. The Thai court has bailed former Prime Minister Thakshin Shinawatra after he was indicted for insulting the royal family. The decision yesterday that the influential billionaire would not be held in pre-trial detention was the first in a series of legal cases with the potential of significant political impact that have Thailand on the edge. In one of four high-profile court cases involving key political players in Thailand on Tuesday, 
The country's influential former prime minister, Thaksin Shinawat, was granted bail after being formally indicted in the morning for allegedly insulting the monarchy. According to his lawyer, Taksin appeared in court and pleaded not guilty to charges of computer crimes and making royal insults. The complaint against him was lodged by the royalist military, stemming from an interview he gave to foreign media in 2015. On Tuesday, Taksin, a powerful backer of the largest party in Thailand's governing coalition, Per Thai, had to surrender his passport as part of his bail condition. Outside the courthouse, his lawyer told reporters Taksin is confident he'll prove his innocence, arguing that the prosecution doesn't have enough evidence. In two other cases involving the opposition Move Forward Party and the incumbent Prime Minister Seta Tawasin, the Constitutional Court set next hearing dates for July. A political novice who took office last year, Seta faces potential dismissal over a cabinet appointment while the Move Forward Party, which won in last year's closely fought election but failed to form a government, could be dissolved for its campaign to amend the royal insult law, or Les Majeste. Seta and Move Forward also deny any wrongdoing. The fourth case involves an ongoing selection process for a new upper house of parliament, which started earlier this month. The Constitutional Court ruled on Tuesday that it is lawful clearing the deck for 200 new lawmakers to take over from a military-appointed Senate later this year. The four cases have put Thai politics and markets on edge. They risk deepening a decades-old rift between the conservative royalist establishment and its opponents, such as the populist ruling Per Thai Party and the Move Forward Party, and could plunge Southeast Asia's second-largest economy into a new period of uncertainty. Saudi Arabia's diplomatic sources confirmed yesterday that at least 550 pilgrims died during the year's Hajj pilgrimage due to extreme heat-related issues. On Monday, temperatures at Mecca's Grand Mosque soared to blistering 51.8 degrees Celsius and the majority of the fatalities were Egyptian pilgrims, along with at least 60 Jordanians and 5 Iranians. According to two Arab diplomats involved in coordinating their respective countries' response, out of the total deceased, 323 were Egyptians, with heat-related illnesses being the primary cause. Reportedly, the death toll among Jordanian pilgrims rose to 60, up from an earlier count of 41. This brings the total number of deaths across multiple countries to 577, based on media estimates. However, Saudi Arabia denies heat-related deaths. Saudi Arabia's health ministry stated that there were no significant heat-related deaths among this year's pilgrims. A recent Saudi study by the Journal of Travel and Medicine highlighted a gradual increase in temperatures in hard ritual areas by 0.4 degrees Celsius per decade, reflecting the impact of climate change. With temperatures crossing the half-century mark on Monday, Egypt's foreign ministry confirmed collaboration with Saudi authorities in searching for missing Egyptians, but did not specify the number of casualties. A group of U.S. lawmakers met with the Tibetan spiritual leader Dalai Lama in India today on a move likely to anger China. The visit came as President Joe Biden appears poised to sign a bill pressuring Beijing to resolve tensions with Tibet and protect the region's native Buddhist culture. A bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers led by Republican Representative Michael McCall met the exiled Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, in India today and said they would not allow China to influence the choice of his successor. They also signaled that Washington would pressure Beijing to hold talks with Tibetan leaders, stalled since 2010, to resolve the Tibet issue with a bill U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to sign soon. Beijing, which calls the Dalai Lama a dangerous splitist or separatist, said it was seriously concerned about the visit of the lawmakers to Dharmasala and the pro-Tibet bill. The Dalai Lama fled to India in 1959 after a failed uprising against Chinese rule in Tibet. Having suffered from health problems for years, the 88-year-old is set to fly to the United States this week for medical treatment. Biden has not met the Dalai Lama since taking office in 2021, and it is not clear if the Tibetan leader will have any engagements during this month's visit. We'll time for a short commercial break. Some interesting US election updates coming right after this.
Welcome back. U.S. cities are breaking decade-old temperature records this week as a heat wave stretches from central to eastern portions of the country in what officials are warning could be a deadly weather event. As roughly 80 million people from Indiana to New England sweltered under a heat advisory or excessive heat warning. U.S. cities are breaking decades-old temperature records this week as a heat wave stretches from central to eastern parts of the country. That's according to the National Weather Service on Tuesday, in what officials are warning could become a deadly weather event. Roughly 80 million people from Indiana to New England are under a heat advisory or excessive heat warning. This is going to be one for the ages. New York Governor Kathy Hochul activated the state's emergency operations center in response to high temperatures expected to last until the weekend. She announced on Tuesday that the state's beaches and public pools will open early, in time for people to enjoy them over Wednesday's Juneteenth holiday. High temperatures can cause dehydration, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke, and worsen pre-existing conditions like cardiovascular problems. Chicago registered 97 degrees Fahrenheit at its O'Hare International Airport on Monday, breaking a record set in 1957. Detroit and Philadelphia, as well as cities in New Hampshire, Connecticut and Maine, are also due for record temperatures in the coming days. That's according to the National Weather Service, which said the heat wave is occurring earlier in the year than the historical average. Central Maine, for example, is running 30 degrees above average. On the road to the White House tonight, President Joe Biden announced a new effort to provide a path to citizenships to hundreds and thousands of illegal immigrants in the U.S. who are married to U.S. citizens. This is an election year move that contrasts sharply with Republican rival Donald Trump's plan for mass deportations. Folks, I'm not interested in playing politics with the border or immigration. I'm interested in fixing it. The steps I'm taking today are overwhelmingly supported by the American people, no matter what the other team says. In fact, polls show over 70 percent of Americans support this effort to keep families together. And the reason is simple. It embraces the American principle that we should be keep families together. According to the White House and Department of Homeland Security, the program will open to an estimated 500,000 spouses who have lived in the U.S. for at least 10 years. Also eligible will be some 50,000 children under the age of 21 with a U.S. citizen parent. Those who are considered public security threats or who have disqualifying criminal history would not be eligible. I refuse to believe that to secure our border, we have to walk away from being an American. Biden, a Democrat seeking a second term in November's presidential election, took office vowing to reverse Trump's restrictive immigration policies. But faced with record levels of migrant arrests at the U.S.-Mexico border, Biden has toughened his approach in recent months barring most migrants crossing the border from requesting asylum. Biden's planned legalization program for spouses of U.S. citizens could reinforce his campaign message that supports a more humane immigration system. The program will allow the spouses and children to apply for permanent residence without leaving the U.S., removing a potentially lengthy process and family separation. Senior Biden administration officials said that the implementation will roll out in the coming months. Meanwhile, former President Trump held a rally in Wisconsin ahead of the first scheduled presidential debate. Both Trump and President Biden have spent time in the battleground state just this month. I just want to begin by saying, hello, Wisconsin, hello. Tonight, Donald Trump making a push in battleground Wisconsin with just over a week until the first scheduled presidential debate. We've had great success here. It's great to be back in this beautiful state with thousands and thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots. The former president highlighting the economy and immigration in a state he narrowly lost in 2020. The small city of Racine getting major attention from both candidates. President Joe Biden visiting just last month, announcing a new $3.3 billion investment by Microsoft building a tech center on the land where Donald Trump joined Foxconn in 2018 to tout a major manufacturing project that never fully materialized. You kidding me? <laughs> Look what happened. They dug a hole with those golden shovels, and then they fell into it. Democrats mocking Trump's visit with this billboard near the event. But at today's rally, the Trump faithful undaunted. 
Trump on stage in Wisconsin today, blasting Biden's order. He's going to formally grant a mass amnesty to millions of illegal aliens that came into our country. The presidential split screen happening as new national polling shows the two men running neck and neck at 49 percent apiece. And with only about four and a half months until Election Day, just two percent of voters saying they're still undecided. Over to Europe now. The lead of France National Rally Party, Jordan Bardella, appealed to voters yesterday to hand his party an absolute majority in the upcoming parliamentary election so that it is able to govern the country effectively. Bardella's Eurosceptic anti-immigration party has its first real chance of winning national power in the June 30th and July 7th ballot. In a bid to become the Prime Minister of France, Jordan Bardella has begun rolling out his promises. On Tuesday, the president of the far-right National Rally Party said that to boost purchasing power, he plans to cut VAT on fuel, gas and electricity. He also wants to break European electricity market rules in an attempt to lower French electricity bills by 30%. Heating and transport are becoming luxuries. I want to take into account the urgency of purchasing power. Another focus is security. Bardella said he wants to reintroduce minimum sentences for drug trafficking and assaulting law enforcement officers. On immigration, he wants to pass an emergency law to end birthright citizenship which experts say is unfeasible. On the other hand, he has postponed reforms that he has long promised. He said that scrapping the VAT on basic necessities would take place at a later date and that repealing the pension reform would not commence until autumn. And then there are measures he seems to have abandoned entirely. He is no longer talking about establishing a national preference. Gone too is the abolition of income tax for the under 30s. Many other commitments would depend on an audit of public accounts that the National Rally says it would undertake if it came to power. Civil Protection Authority said that at least 11 people have died in El Salvador due to torrential rains that have lashed Central America's Pacific coast since the weekend, while nearly 900 people are still in temporary shelters. The rains have soaked swathes of the land across the Pacific coast from the southern Mexico down to western Panama. Forecasters have predicted more rain through the week and warned this could be extremadated by a storm that is soon forecast over the Gulf of Mexico. In neighbouring Honduras, authorities also launched evacuations and said over 5,000 have been affected, largely due to flooding in the hard-hit southern department of Vale, which borders El Salvador. As far south as Panama, authorities emitted alerts but reported no serious damages. Videos shared on social media from across the region showed streets flooded with fast-flowing water, fallen trees, families and past evacuating onto trucks and emergency responders working through the night to clear the roadways. Both the Pacific and Atlantic have entered the start of their hurricane season. The Atlantic is forecast to be especially active due to the combination of the effects from the La Nina weather pattern and the warm ocean winds. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. Let's go on to an incredible story of determination and lifelong learning. At 105 years old, this lady has defied the odds by returning to Stanford University to finally complete her master's degree in education more than eight decades after putting her studies on hold for love. This past Sunday, Stanford University held its commencement exercise. The ceremony for undergraduates ran about a half hour behind schedule. Welcome, everyone. So those getting their graduate degrees had to wait a bit to receive their diplomas. Oh, really? Which did not bother Virginia Hislop in the least. <laughs> What's a few more minutes to wait for something she earned back in... In 1940? Yes, 84 years ago, the now 105-year-old Virginia was working on her master's degree in education at Stanford. Virginia was almost done when, as she puts it, life intervened. It was the eve of World War II and Virginia's husband George was a newly appointed second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. His unit was called up and Virginia soon found herself 1,500 miles away from Stanford. That's not going to stay on. What Virginia didn't give a lot of thought to, though... I've had that trouble before. ...was that degree. But recently, 
her son-in-law contacted Stanford and learned something amazing. And so at the Graduate School of Education commencement, alongside 160 members of the class of 2024, there was a single member of the class of 1940. And as Virginia got up on stage, the crowd got up on their feet. Virginia views it all as recognition, not just of what she did 80 plus years ago, but of all the work in education she has done since. My goodness, I've waited a long time. <laughs> it's a lesson the rest of the day's graduates would do well to take away. A diploma is nice, sure, but not necessarily needed to go out and make the world a better place. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. So stay tuned as Sina Maya Dune will join shortly with the nightly business report. Thank you and have a good night.